pianists and teachers and colleagues and friends. Today we're talking about how to teach the Clementi Sonatino, Opus 36, number one, the third movement, Vivace. It sounds like this. great, very well-loved sonatina movement for students in the early intermediate level. When I judge at sonatina festivals or our Illinois AIM exams, I frequently hear this movement. So I would just say, if you're a teacher and you're sending a student into an exam or a competition, it's always nice to hear sonatinas that are not Opus 36. This falls into the well-loved, overplayed category. That being said, I do love this movement and I love teaching it because students really enjoy playing it. I do think this third movement is easier than the first movement, which of course sounds like this. And I do have a video on that first movement, which I will link here and you can just click right up there in the corner to find that. You can find this movement in many editions. Today I am looking at this in the festival collection and I do really like this particular book. Helen Marley includes all movements of this sonatina in this book, and I love her editing on particularly Baroque and classical music. I think this series is very strong in Baroque and classical, although I will say they also include many more current contemporary pieces than some of the other series that I enjoy using, and there are even some pieces by female composers in this series. Okay, so let's talk about what our students need to know in order to play this piece well and what we're gonna work on with them in this piece. We're in C major and we have a lot of C major chords and scales. We also have a modulation to G major, so we, our students need to understand G major scales as well. And we'll come right back to that in a minute. But first to say about the form of this piece, you might expect a rondo at the end of a sonatina like this. And this feels a little bit like rondo form, but I think a better way of explaining this form is actually that it's a sonata form without a development. So we have an A section, which would be the first theme, and a B section, which might be the second theme, and then it just goes right back to the A section followed by another B section. The first time we have that B section or second theme, it does go to G major, the dominant, and of course then the second time we stay in C major. And that actually is the one of the first things I want you to talk about with your student, besides finding the scales and learning that opening motive, which they can then just go home and be able to play, we are gonna look at the differences between the two B sections so that they can memorize this and play it accurately. And if you're a teacher who doesn't feel confident teaching memorization, do listen carefully as I talk through this because just some very basic analysis of this can help your students really understand and be prepared to play this well from memory. All right, so we begin in C major and the left hand is doing a very basic C major broken chord. That's one of the things that makes this so easy to play is that most of the A section just has that. We do have this interesting C, D, F, which is a little bit like, I don't know, you could think of it as a B diminished chord since that's what the right hand has, or a G7 over the C pedal. So I really think it's kind of like we're in C major with a G7 harmony just staying over that pedal point C. And then the left hand gets to play this octave, which is also fun for students have to block it so you don't have to be able to reach an octave. I actually call this the minuet pattern because in every minuet you play that, right? It's always that do, so, do at the end of the piece. So this is the minuet pattern ascending, going up. So right away I would probably just start with that. Can your left hand play these broken chords or should we block it first? Now, before we work on the right hand, we need to talk a little bit about the time signature, which if your student noticed that there were three beats per measure, then they might have already seen that this is in 3-8 time. The reason this is not a difficult 3-8 time is because the left hand keeps the eighth note pulse constant the whole time. 
So yes, your students do need to understand that in compound meter, 16th notes get the one and two and three and that division of the beat. I think with this piece, you're gonna end up doing a little bit of rote teaching or they're just gonna have already heard that main melody, but it's helpful to go through and say, okay, here's how we count this. One and two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. But actually, this is one reason why I would not delay playing hands together on this piece very long, because just by playing the left hand eighth notes, you're going to solve any rhythm problems that actually crept up in the right hand part. In that right hand first theme, of course, you want to use nice articulation, which Dr. Marley has noted is a slur, two staccatos, and then a longer slur, lift, new slur into this two note slur, the downbeat of measure four. So you want to have this lovely down, up, up gesture right there. Hopefully your student at this level already understands two note slurs and can identify them and automatically play down, up, or more or less. As they go on from there, measure five. That measure seven can be problematic for having clean, clear fingers. I think it's best done with some rotation for particularly those beats, the F, E, F, D. So if you're not familiar with rotation, that's simply when you don't pick up your individual fingers, you just let your wrist rotate or your forearm rotate, and that allows the fingers to simply fall into the key as an extension of the arm. So I'm going to jump all the way over to the end and look at the B section here the second time because this is in C major. So let's talk about the C major chords first. If I start in measure 50, with the pick up to 55 and then I just have a long C major scale with one little dip to the B and then turn around so again your students should know their C major scale fingering at this point and we should be able to say okay that's a C major scale starting on that high G I'm going all the way down to the middle C grab the B and come back around with one little third at the end while you're doing that, your left hand is not doing very much. <laughs> so we have a one octave arpeggio here, and then some steps, and then the one octave arpeggio. It is worth noting that students oftentimes are thinking about the C major broken chords, and they'll frequently just use five, three, one, but you do need to remind them, okay, this is the arpeggio, measure 58 right there so you do have to use 5 3 2 1 or 5 4 2 1 whatever your preferred arpeggio fingering is and they're going to be need, need to be ready for that in measure 50 yes 50 i think i misspoke earlier so the b section starts in 51 50 has the arpeggio as well as back at the beginning measure 16 your student needs to be ready to finish this part with the arpeggio going up to middle C. That is a problem spot that my students sometimes mess up. So you have to circle that fingering or highlight it or something along those lines so that they're ready to put their um, two on the G and continue up that arpeggio. So back in the first iteration of the B section, we have these scales in G major because we have modulated to the dominant. So same thing, if I start on the downbeat of 25, it's this high D. I just go a G major scale, standard G major scale fingering, all the way down to treble G, cross over, grab the F sharp, and come back. And then you can add the little pick up, pick up to 25. So the part that your students need to understand for memorization, and for frankly just learning accurately, is that the B section, while the first few measures are the same, there's a big change. This happens in measure 20 versus measure 54. So the first time, this is 17. The right hand goes up that broken chord. And then we repeat this first part and go up to E. And then we've transitioned to D. Second time, we start the exact same way. 
but the left hand does that arpeggio, and then we start the scale in C major. So what I would have my students do is practice those two parts back to back because that will really firm up in the memory. First time I do this, stop. Second time I do this. rely on muscle memory or even their ear in order to play this correctly. They have to actually cognitively think in their head, the first time I do this and then I play my G major scales, and the second time I do this and then I play my C major scales. If you have questions about memorization or basic analysis and teaching that to early intermediate students, please leave a comment below. I would love to chat with you about that. Memorization is a hot topic and people don't always agree, but I do feel like we need to teach our students good analysis tools so that they can understand their music and be able to play it from memory if they would like to do so. The most fun part of this piece is the contrasting dynamics. And so you want to definitely draw your students' attention to that. When you model performance this, when they're first learning it, you want to definitely show them the big surprising changes from piano to forte because that's what makes this fun. So we have this tiny little motive at measure 17. And then surprise forte. And then a little softer. That I think is the most fun part of this piece. After that, in the scales, we have a little bit of crescendo and diminuendo, but those are the big surprising changes, as well as that first motive, measure one is marked piano and measure nine is marked forte. So we get to replay that opening theme at a much louder dynamic. All right, I hope that gives you a few ideas on how to teach this very fun and energetic third movement from Clementi's Opus 36, number one. If you have other pieces you'd like me to cover, please feel free to leave a comment. If you haven't already, subscribe to my channel and click the bell so you get notifications when I've got a new video up, and I wish you all the best in your teaching.